next is our uh, online presentation. Uh, this is by Luca Scorich, uh, and this is on parallel window decoding. Uh, so I think he can share. I don't know how this works practically. Yep, okay, that's visible, okay. Uh, Luca, take it away. Yes, um, thank you uh, for uh, having me. And um, sorry, I wasn't able to be there in person. Um, today, I'm going to talk about our work uh, for me and my collaborators at Riverlane on well window decoding and discuss how it enables scalable, fault-tolerant quantum computation. Um, so, sticking with the river team, we are going to start uh, at the source. Uh, many of you might appreciate that path decoding is important, but here we're going to discuss why it's essential for practical fault tolerant quantum computation. Uh, then, I'm going to discuss the current leading proposal for real time decoding, which is the sliding window method, and why this method inherently does not scale. Uh, in the main part of the talk, we're going to describe our proposed solution to this problem, uh, which we call the parallel window method, and discuss some of its implications. And uh, finally, uh, we are going to uh, go to the delta of the river and discuss how the parallel window method affects the decoding speed in a hardware decoder that Riverlane is developing. Uh, so uh, why do we actually need fast decoding? Uh, so here, I will be focusing on the surface code, which is described by a planar patch of stabilizers with two logical operators on it, Z and X. And in decoding in general, uh, we have syndrome qubits that give us information about the errors. And the problem that we are trying to solve is finding the most likely error consistent with the syndrome. In the case on the picture, we have a few syndromes light up. And this error can be explained by the X error here and the Z error there and the total effect of the error is that the Z logical is flipped. However, the errors can occur uh, on the syndrome qubits as well. So to detect that, we have to continuously repeat syndrome measurements. And the full problem consists of a 3D graph, which uh, we depict with uh, time running up. The edges in the graph are possible error locations, where data errors are horizontal edges uh, and measurement errors vertical edges. And then the errors in the middle of the syndrome extraction circuit result in diagonal or hook errors. And the task is to solve minimum weight perfect matching problem on this graph uh, using uh, so finding a, a pairing up triggered syndrome using a lowest weight set of edges. And it's important to understand why this problem really needs to be solved in real time while the syndromes are being read. So let's first consider Clifford circuits, uh, which include simulations like quantum memory. So when I'm showing circuits here, the lines are always logical qubits that are represented by, say, uh, surface code patches and consist of potentially many physical qubits. In the case of Clifford's circuits, as long as we can detect where the errors happen, uh, we can always commute them through Clifford operations in post-processing and then reinterpret the measurements. So um, as long as we can uh, store the, sim uh, the syndrome information, uh, we can decode in post-processing on an laptop and reinterpret the measurement results. Um, but this is not enough. Clifford circuits can easily be simulated on classical computers, and they don't give us any quantum advantage. So uh, we need, really need to be able to do non-Clifford circuits as well, um, such as, for example, T-gates. These types of gates are implemented full tolerantly, usually using circuits such as a uh, teleportation circuit with a magic state and that uh, contains some classical feedback. So here, we initialize a magic state, run a teleportation circuit. And then based on this Z measurement, we implement an S gate. Uh, remember here again, all lines are surface code patches. And to interpret this measurement correctly, we need to have the result of decoding uh, for all rounds that came before the measurement. And we need to wait for this feedback. So there is a delay here before we can apply the escape. Uh, so here we really need uh, live feedback and real-time decoding. But how quick does this feedback need to be? 
So let's assume that the coding time scales linearly with uh, the number of uh, QEC rounds to be decoded. But here we define an F factor, which is the ratio of how quickly the data is coming in and how quickly we are resolving these syndromes. So if F is bigger than one, the syndromes are coming in faster than we can resolve them. And then let's suppose that's the case. We are collecting syndromes faster than decoding them. So we collect this data for time t. It takes us to perform the control knot and the measurement. And then we need to wait for the decoder to decode for uh, f, oh, sorry, for um, some time here, uh, which is ft minus t, before we can decide whether we need to apply the S gate. And while we're here waiting here, more data is being added to our backlog because our logical state here is idle and we still need to do error correction on it and constantly collect the data. So in the next step, when we want to apply the following non-Clifford gate, we now need to decode all the data in the backlog and then all the new data coming from uh, the repeated circuit. This means that we will have to wait for classical feedback for a factor of f longer before we can apply the next s gate. So if we keep doing this, we see that the nth t gate takes at least f to the n time. Uh, and this leads to an exponential slowdown for each subsequent t gate. So let's see what happens if we're not fast enough in practice. Well, here we consider superconducting qubits, which can execute one QEC round in one microsecond. This is a very strange experiment for decoders because there is only so much sequential comp uh, com computation we can fit within one microsecond. So for simulations of chemical elements, for instance, a MOCO, we need to, of the order of 10 to the 10 gates, uh, which could take a few days to execute on full tolerant uh, quantum computer with no lag. Now say that the decoder lags just a tiny bit. It's on average 1% slower than the syndrome uh, acquisition speed. This would mean that the total computation takes much, much longer than the age of the universe. We can see how this instantly kills any quantum uh, advantage that we might have from the computer. This is also not easy to avoid because most decoders take longer for bigger codes. Uh, but longer computation we need, means that we need bigger codes leading to slower decoding, and inevitably, we hit a backlog problem. Therefore, this means that there is a maximum limit on the size of quantum algorithms we can execute in this way. So the current leading proposal for um, real-time decoding sets the maximum limit of quantum algorithms before the, the, we hit an exponential slowdown for each subsequent degate. To better understand why this arises, we uh, first consider an initial proposal for real-time decoding, which is the sliding window method. So here we show uh, the decoding scheme on an example of a repetition code. But here, everything uh, that I'm going to be talking about generalizes to the surface code by just adding another dimension to this picture. Each row is a round of uh, error correction, and the time is going up. Syndromes are continuously collected until the end of the computation. Green dots here are trigger defects uh, that give us information about the errors. And horizontal edges are potential data qubit errors, vertical edges potential measurement errors. To decode this, we need to solve a matching problem. This means we need to pair up the defects by walking uh, along the edges, such that the total edge distance is minimal. We, in theory, we can process this as uh, all at once. But as the computation progresses, the problem gets longer and longer and we need some way of breaking it up. So what we do is take a subset of data, or, or what we call a window. We can decode this window with uh, any decoder and acquire the correction within that window. This can be minimally perfect matching or, say, union fine. But we cannot be confident about the corrections towards the top of the window because we don't know what defects come after. So to account for that, we split the window into a commit region in which we take the corrections to be final, and the buffer region, which we leave for the next step. So we decode over the whole window, but only commit to the edges in the commit region. Here it is important that the buffer region is large enough to uh, have enough context for uh, decoding the commit region. So the protection against the time-like errors is given by the size of the buffer region, uh, because any string of edges that starts uh, at the, the begins in the commit region if they're shorter than the buffer region, they're going to be uh, completely captured within the window. 
So we usually choose the size of the commit region and size of the buffer region to be both about the distance of the code, which is the protection of the errors in the spatial direction. It will have about equal protection. So in the next step, we move the window up. Uh, we uh, see the, so here we see the committed corrections, the string of edges that are going from the commit to the buffer region. We only commit to the boundary, uh, and this creates artificial defects that are then resolved in this next step. And then we again uh, decode the leftover corrections from the first step together with the new buffer region and keep moving the window up until we reach the end of the computation. So while we might expect that uh, the logical fidelity is going to be somewhat reduced as opposed to decoding the full computation with a global decoder, we expect this to be negligible as long as the buffer region is large enough. Uh, so by doing this, we have successfully broken down the problem into smaller problems that we can manage and solve in real time while the algorithm is running. Uh, so we ran the numerics for uh, the sliding window decoder to see what this actually looks like. Uh, we compare the sliding window decoder uh, to the global uh, minimum weight perfect matching on the phenomenological polynoise and rotated planar code. So here we track logical error rate as a function of number of decoding rounds for a range of code distances. Uh, lines here are the global decoder, so decode everything as one single big block, and the points are sliding window decoder. Um, the fact that the points here match the lines uh, imply that the sliding window data uh, is has no noticeable drop in accuracy compared to the global decoder. But on the right, as we uh, might expect, as we increase the code size, uh, the decoding frequency quickly reduces, uh, meaning that uh, there is going to be a point, the code distance, at which uh, the decoder will no longer be able to keep up with data acquisition, and we will inevitably encounter the backup problem. And this is simply because each window has increasing number of data that needs to be processed uh, in a block. Uh, so now we know that the sliding window method does not scale. Uh, let's look at our solution that we call a parallel window method. Here, I would also like to point out that there is a second work by Tan et al. Uh, from Alibaba that has a lot of complementary results and that came out the same day as ours. So if you're interested in this work, please check that work out as well. So we can think of decoding, as I described it, uh, as consisting of two decoders. The first one is the inner decoder that resolves the syndrome within a given block of data. This is what we call an inner decoder. And the second, or outer decoder, is how we stitch these blocks together. Uh, and this can be a global decoder, so just take one block. It can be sliding window decoder, or it can be our proposed parallel window decoder. So in the sliding window, as we slide the decoder, we amass this backlog of data that gets worse on each subsequent window if we are not fast enough. So we thought, can we do something with the data? Can we start decoding it in parallel before the window has caught up with it? So we do this by dividing the decoding problem into a number of disjoint windows that are to be executed in parallel. Uh, now, we don't know what defects come before or after the window. So we need a buffer region, similarly as before, but now on both top and the bottom of the window. And we only commit to the edges in the middle region. Then following, uh, so following the same procedure as with the sliding window, we decode full windows and only commit to the edges in the commit region. And because these are independent of each other, they work on different sets of syndromes, all of these can be executed in parallel. So after this step, which we call decode step A, we are left with undecoded parts between the commit regions. So in the second or B step, we decode all of these. Now, since we're confident about the corrections before and after B windows, we don't need any buffer regions and we can commit to the whole window. Again, because all of these are uh, disjoint, they can all be processed in parallel uh, in a single run. So in this way, in two steps and given enough parallel processes, we can decode full history of syndrome data in the time it takes to decode two windows. In theory, uh, as I said, this is true, but in practice, uh, we need, uh, we have some uh, number of parallel processes that we can have. So some, a, some windows are going to have to be done in series. But this allows us to linearly increase the throughput by increasing the number of parallel processes. And this is 
uh, expected to be linear because there is no data sharing requirement between the parallel processes. Only some only B windows depend on the two neighboring A windows. So parallelization is very efficient and we expect very low uh, overheads. Similarly as before, we again choose the commit and buffer region to be uh, about size D to uh, have no drop in logical accuracy. So we again uh, ran the numerics uh, using phenomenological polynoids first. Uh, again, rotative planar code and using minimum wave perfect matching in our decoder here. And again, similar as before, we see that as we increase the number of rounds, uh, the lines, which is the global decoder, match the points, which is the parallel window decoder on the logical error rate across different code sizes. This tells us that again, there is no logical uh, reduction in accuracy. But now on the right, we see that as we increase the number of processes, the decoding speed or decoding frequency increases linearly. So this means that for any code size and uh, irrespective of how fast our decoder is, we can have, as long as we can have enough parallel processes, we can have high enough throughput uh, so that we avoid this back of problem. We've also done uh, recently uh, done these simulations on circuit level noise, which is uh, more realistic. And again, we see uh, similar results that on the left plot that there is no drop in logical accuracy as the points match the lines. And on the right, as we increase the number of processes, the decoding speed increases. There is some sublinearity here, but we expect this is mainly due to software overheads in parallelization in Python. But if this was implemented in uh, hardware decoder, we would expect very low uh, overheads and be able to scale to many processes before we hit any sublinearity. So going back to the backlog problem, uh, having parallel window decoder, we can guarantee that the lag is not going to be greater than the time it takes to decode two windows, so A and B steps, and uh, as long as we have enough parallel processes. Our throughput is always going to match the stream of syndrome that are being uh, generated. So therefore, the total algorithm running time is going to be uh, linear in the time it takes to decode windows. So we avoid the backlog problem, but it's still very worthwhile building fast decoders because they will determine the logical clock rate or the speed of the computation. So, but this is now only linear instead of exponential in the number of D gates. So far, we've been discussing only how to parallelize in time to solve the backlog problem. But the same method is applicable in parallelizing in space. For example, certain decoding scenarios, such as lattice surgery, we might end up with codes which are much larger in one of the directions that protect than the protection against errors that we require. In these cases, we can parallelize in much the same way as before in that direction. But we can also parallelize in more dimensions. The key here is to divide the space into commit regions. Here we separate the 2D space into our hexagonal regions. We can then decode in parallel all, all regions that do not touch each other. And uh, we do this by adding, again, buffer regions uh, around them. And the amount of protection against errors is going to be associated with the size of the buffer region. We can decode this to the space by doing all the red regions in parallel, then all the blue ones, and then all the green ones. So that means in three steps, we can, we can decode uh, this very large 2D space. And then we can further generalize this by adding more dimensions. Uh, so now we know that uh, our methods can improve the scalability. But uh, the next question is, how does this look like in practice? What does it mean for hardware decoding? So uh, as I hopefully convince you by now, we uh, the speed of decoding is essential. And this means that eventually we will need a large amount of fast and efficient decoding hardware. That is why Riverlane is developing both FPGA and ASIC hardware solutions. And we have an infrastructure that allows us to test uh, any theoretical decoders in simulation, but also deploy them in hardware. So here I'm showing modeling data of our most recent decoder. Um, we have a high confidence in our modeling tools because they have good correlations with FPGA decoders. And we have also recently taped out our first ASIC. So we envision that the Riverlink hardware is going to become an integral part of the future of all tolerant computers. We have a paper on this that should be coming to archive uh, within the next month or so. In the left plot, we're showing modeling data of our decoder uh, that can accurately decode even fastest superconducting quantum hardware in real time. 
So for low noise hardware and medium sized codes, we don't expect we will need parallelization as our decoder cores are fast enough. Uh, this also means that our clock rate is going to be as fast as it can be. However, as the, if the noise is higher or we want to go to very large codes, we will inevitably going to need to parallelize. Um, and using the parallel window method over multiple cores, we can uh, scale to much larger code sizes, even on noisy hardware. So on the right, we see that even with a pretty large noise rate, circuit level noise rate, with a modest number of 16 cores, we can get to distance 13 with no uh, significant issues. Uh, so therefore, at Rivalin, we're confident we can support real-time decoding of near-term quantum hardware, and we are able to scale as the hardware uh, improves and the number of qubits increases. So to conclude, um, here we presented the power window method, which allows us to achieve almost arbitrary decoding speed, overcoming uh, the black problem by scaling the number of parallel resources. And it can be combined with any inner decoder, so like minimally perfect matching union fine or anything else that might come up and has no noticeable loss in logical fidelity. And we also believe it's well suited for hardware decoders. Um, so I would like to thank the uh, group of authors that worked, worked on this work, as well as Riverlane team that supported it and uh, Riverlane leadership. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Thank you for the for the wonderful talk. Um, so uh, here you presented decoding methods for the surface code specifically, which is of course very well motivated. But I'm curious, like to what extent do these problems arise in other interesting families of codes, and to what extent are these methods applicable there, like say like hyperbolic surface codes or something? So in terms of hyperbolic surface codes, I wouldn't expect. Uh, there to be much of a difference. But there is, uh, if the code has very high level of connectivity, then this uh, buffer region, which is defined like a distance, or, so you can't really limit it to separate regions. So if, for example, LDPC codes, which can have uh, very long range connectivity would mean that the buffer region would very quickly grow. Uh, in this case, it would be less practical, I would assume, but we haven't really investigated it. So uh, maybe there is a way to limit the size, it's just that if, as long as you can define the buffer region to be um, a certain distance away and still have like a limited decoding volume, that uh, I don't see why that won't work. I see, that sounds very interesting. I'd be very curious to see if that could be generalized to anything LDPC. Okay, any other questions? Thanks for the talk. Uh, I might be a bit confused about something basic, but uh, in this algorithm about parallel decoding, how is it that we are at step time t and in parallel decoding errors that happen at step time t and a few future time step like t plus one? <coughs> Sorry. So, uh, yeah, as, as I was saying, this data syndrome data is coming in and. All we need to know is uh, at some point when we need to make a decision, we need to have the history of data decoded before it. So we can, uh, we're not decoding in the future as such, it's just that we collected the syndrome data. If, uh, in, so in case of a sliding window decoder, we would be decoding say this window, somewhere down there, but we already collected some data ahead of it because we're just too slow and there is this backlog of data coming in. What we're saying is, uh, as the date come in, comes in, immediately start decoding it in the next parallel step. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks. Anyone else? Okay, if not, we'll thank Luger again. Thank you.